Let's see if my buttons actually work correctly this time. <laughs> this show is brought to you by our patrons at patreon.com slash Elder Scrolls Lorecast. Robots Radio presents The Elder Scrolls Lorecast. Welcome to the Elder Scrolls Lorecast, a place where the Elder Scrolls community can come together to discuss the boundaries of our knowledge about the universe of the Elder Scrolls. All right, adventurers, welcome back. I am your host, Tom or Robots, and I am here as usual with my wonderful companion. We're kind of companions on this adventure, right? The adventure yeah, seems good. of life. Lotus of Doom. Aww. How's it going, buddy? Uh, it's going pretty well. Going pretty well. Nice, nice. Yeah, so it's a, it's kind of a regular Thursday night around here, you know, just kind of doing the Thursday night thing, streaming live on twitch.tv slash robots radio, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, and we're back this week to talk about something that uh, Lotus and I were discussing, we think is a really cool topic, because I haven't covered it yet on the show, and... It's probably going to have a lot to do with some of the stuff coming out soon in the new storyline expansion for the Elder Scrolls Online. And that specific topic is the Reach and the Reachmen, the people who live there. So Lotus, what do we know about what do we know about the Reach? Where is the Reach? So the Reach is to the western side of Skyrim, kind of bordering on going into the eastern side of High Rock. It's that that little region there uh, that, you know, it's almost like there's a map on the uh, video version. It's amazing. Yeah, I've been playing with the, for, for those of you listening to the audio version of this, I've been playing with um, the new NVIDIA broadcast thing, and I am actually have a map behind me in quotes uh, of Skyrim. And you can see up on the map that it is right there it's highlighted in the map and it includes markarth which happens to be the title of the next expansion yes which um to that note i would just like to say uh great improvement in my opinion on the naming uh where it's just <laughs> now the region name as opposed to dark storm i believe it was or what whatever it was prior to uh, yeah. i i like the region name much much better and even though it's, you know, fit, fits the theme, it's just like, okay, I, I, I prefer a little more variety. So the fact that we're just going to the reach, I feel like is very fitting as well uh, yeah. to Skyrim and all of the stuff. I think it's a wise choice to name the location. Like had Greymore been called something like, um, uh, what's the, uh, the major city? Solitude. Solitude, had, yeah. Had it been called Solitude or something like that, that may have been interesting it also may have played into the story in the events like there's certain elements of feeling alone and things you know you could could have played that into the story a little bit mm -hmm. um but yeah this this idea that we're going to markarth and everybody who's played skyrim has been to markarth we know what's going on in markarth at least in the fourth era but we don't necessarily know what's going on in markarth in the second era and spoilers, it has to do with Reachmen, most likely, because that's the realm that we're in. This is the part of the world that we're in. And I love this. Uh, Lotus, we get these little bits of detail uh, of these, um, I don't know what to call them. You have kind of, they're almost like nation states with like yeah realms it, it, in them you know you got like skyrim as a whole you've got um right. cyrodiil it, as a whole but then you have these other little zones within them yeah there's the you know obviously there's the like province thing and then it's subdivided into the holds yeah and and yeah. each of the holds i i feel is pretty unique um in in skyrim and the region around it um the hold system they have is is pretty cool to be fair I, I like them and they get pretty diverse depending upon whether you're in the rift or whether you're in markarth or whether you're in winterhold because even though the whole region is known for being cold and northern and stuff like that 
the rift has got the autumn feel to it you know um uh, falkreath has kind of almost like the spring vibe to it uh and then you know the further north you go if you go to windhelm or winterhold it's just like a barren snow field and yeah. all of that so yeah. there's, there's some good variety even within the overarch i feel like it's all of new england condensed into one zone so <laughs> yeah i guess i guess you could say that yeah uh, <laughs> overall you can tell it's cold everywhere but some of some of it, it looks is- less cold and then other yeah, places some of more temperate. yeah yeah so the reach is interesting because it borders on uh high rock and that the other zones that kind of butt up against to the western side of of skyrim and mm-hmm. there are peoples in this area who define themselves by their history which most people do but this group of people call themselves the reachmen and they don't see themselves as being nords and they don't see themselves as being um bretons they they see themselves as a, se- a separate distinct group of people and yep. um they're known as the witch men of high rock and uh, they are a tribal race of humans who inhabit the reach in southwestern skyrim and also the western reach in the east part of high rock the re- the reach is actually a little bit more substantial than just the parts of skyrim that we've been able to visit so far um one of the side notes on this is that uh, i'm fully expecting that the map will include uh, th- some of these areas in the ESO expansion. We haven't seen it yet. We don't know exactly how that's going to work, but it, it should fit right into the zones. And I don't have the Elder Scrolls Online map. I was looking for one to really show a representation of where it might be. Um, but actually, you know what? I, ha- I have this. I'm going to pull up one for people who are watching on stream. And you can see in this one that uh, at the top here, this is representative of the, the area that we were able to go to in Greymore near solitude so and this is actually inlaid over top of the skyrim map so it's kind of a mix of the two they're not perfect they don't perfectly fit on top of each other but if you look here in this lower section i feel like a, a weather caster i was about to say this i feel like you're region. talking yeah. about the coastal storm coming from right. northern high rock into <laughs> the reach yeah so this is the region over here down below that area that we are most likely to, going to be going into um, the other thing that's noteworthy about this is it leaves the complete middle area. There's like a middle column of Skyrim that is just completely unvisited in Elder Scrolls Online still. Yes. So I, who knows what they're going to do with that in the future? Yeah, I don't I don't I don't, I don't know how they're going to decide on doing something with that. That is kind of strange that there is going to just be a. A column's kind of a good way to put it. It's uh-huh. just like this swath of map right across the middle. They're like, yeah, this is still undefined, I guess, which is strange with a gray more like very Skyrim focused year involving Greymore and we're going to end the Skyrim season and it's still not going to be complete. That's a little peculiar. Um, although they fleshed out a lot of what's under Skyrim, which we did not really understand prior, yeah. just how big uh, Blackreach really is, and they they fleshed that out and made that very cool under the un- underneath. Right. Well, one of the things that I've heard a lot of people talk about is White Run, and when they were talking about we're going back to Skyrim, a lot of people were like, "Oh, good, we get to go see White Run again," because of course everybody remembers White Run. It's a very important hold in the story. Yep. As you play through Skyrim. Um, so it gives them opportunity to, are they going to extend it into a second year? Are they going to come back a few years from now and go back to Skyrim again and flesh out these other zones? So we don't really know exactly yet what's going to happen with that. But I, I do like that we are getting the reach. The reach, as I noted on the previous episode, was one of the areas that I was predicting was going to be coming into the events. So let's go into some of the people and what they're like. The the Reachmen are very tribal, and you guys will remember them from Skyrim. Uh, the Briarhearts, the Hagravens, the um, the the clothes that you get from the Reach. They have uh, oftentimes they have uh, antlers and um, deer heads and skins and furs and and those kinds of things on their bodies. They use bones and and they seem very primitive. The um, the other groups in that region who have taken over that region over over time uh whether they were the imperials or the nords have often considered them a nuisance they don't they they're very much against 
uh, siding with anybody who's not them, anyone who's other. So they, even though they get conquered, they tend to still kind of keep to themselves and keep their culture going. Um, you have any other any other things you want to throw in there, Lotus? No, it, they are. I mean, that so far, you're that that's pretty much exactly my take on it. They're almost like an elusive third faction in in this whole. Whenever there's a controversy going on between, you know, Eastern Skyrim and Western Skyrim, or later on, it's um, the uh, Nords and the Imperials. It, they're never picking a side. It doesn't seem like they're always just, yeah, we're here. We're the Reachmen. Like, it doesn't matter what your issue is because we should trump both of your issues and just take over. Right. So, right. yeah, they, they're always just kind of like a floater wild card regardless of what dispute is currently going on usually over land and stuff like that yeah yeah so uh, i'm going to quote some of the stuff in here um they're also known for their hedge magic they and, and here's the thing is that they they constantly are underestimated they are not unintelligent they are not incapable of things they are not without magical prowess um they originally evolved from the Bretons. They are, you know, of Breton stock. Of course, they've, you know, mingled with the Nords and, and of course, all the complexity that comes with that. So that means that they have, uh, at least some of them have a very high natural magical uh, prowess. That's why they're considered the Witchmen of High Rock. Um, some Reachmen mages are known to wield magic, which they can poison, use to poison or corrupt nature. Uh, they're also said to have learned to control beast folk magic, a wild uh, hedge wizard, which is often described as primitive or high, uh, hedge wizardry, which is described as primitive. And it's almost like it's described as primitive because it's more nature focused and it has to do with the beast folk who everybody looks down on. Um, yeah, but that doesn't mean it's any less sophisticated. It's still powerful magic. It's just not focused on illusory magic or, you know, the things the yeah. high elves would value. I guess it's just less organized, so people like, you know, it's like, oh, this isn't in a textbook, so I'm going to just downplay it as something that's, that's you know, not as refined, which sounds very Sigic Order slash Ultmer style, so yeah. I guess it just plays into that even more. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like if you don't put it in a bunch of books in a fancy library in a marble building, then it's not considered to be as good a style of magic as right. something else. Um, they're they're known for uh, being involved with like the weird covens. You go through uh, some of these zones in Elder Scrolls Online, and you have to deal with the weird covens and the weird trees and and those kinds of things. Um, there's the uh, Hag Feather Coven, the Rhyme Rock Weird, and the Markarth Sisters. Uh, they're known to have close relations with the Reachmen and their magic. So there's some connections yep. there to some of these. Uh, I guess what you consider more like. Um, stylistically witchy coven type uh, parts of their culture which uh, of yeah course... to, to be fair the the warden class in eso fits very much into um that whole vibe as well weird by the way being w-y-r-d yes. as opposed to they're just weird because of right. where they are so right. yeah right. um but yeah, that the the class that was added back with the uh, Morrowind expansion in Elder Scrolls Online brought in the uh, Warden class, which had enemies had had access to it in in the programming. It's just it wasn't player focused, so that was kind of interesting getting to get our hands on that class and have a form of nature magic to ourselves, uh, you know, on the player side of things as well. Yeah. Yeah, nature magic is cool. It doesn't mean that it's not as as important or powerful. If it's just, right, it's just different. It's just different. <laughs> yeah, um, and in some ways, it's a little bit more uh, tied to uh, the formative nature of the world, like the earth bones and things like that. You know, there's there's some connection there. Uh, another connection that they have is often to uh, the Daedra, which is another reason why some of the more formalized uh, societies probably think that they're wild and uncontrollable uh, many clans worship her scene um, that's probably the most likely of the Daedric princes that you would find the Reachmen worshiping on top of their warrior ranks commonly uh, they, they commonly commune with her scene so that they may ritualistically replace their hearts with poisoned briars allowing them to become atrocities known as briar hearts which Lotus didn't talk a little bit about a little bit um, yeah those those uh, it's such a cool concept for an enemy and 
in ESO when you're in the Daggerfall Covenant exploring some of uh, the reach threat that's kind of flooding throughout the region. You're in Stormhold, you're in High Rock, you're in the areas, on, on, I guess, more on the western side of the situation from where we were originally discussing in Skyrim, but the eastern side of you know High Rock and everything like that. Yep. You're getting a lot of their influence around the region, and uh, you actually get to see the formation of some of their zombie-type creatures and the Briar Hearts, where they're just like essentially being grown as they're sacrificed, their bodies are thrown there, and then the magic, or what they're doing is cast, and it, the vines are like basically forming into these former people and turning them into these creations and stuff like that. It, it's it's very cool. It's um, if, if you were to play ESO, it's along the Daggerfall Covenant main storyline you encounter quite a bit of uh, reach magic and hedge magic of them spawning some of their creations. Yeah, yeah. I like that part of the, the campaign. It's a lot of fun. Um, yep. The, the other thing is that some of the new stuff that you play through in the most recent expansion has a lot of that similar kind of feel to the magic. The, um, yes, it does. The vines, the, the earth connection to mm -hmm. things, but the corruption of the earth at the same time. Um, yep. That all of that is is still very connected to this, which uh, makes sense from a story standpoint that we're going to dig into a little bit more of what's actually behind everything that's going on in in Skyrim during these expansions. Right. Because, I mean, one of the expansions is literally named after Harrowstorm, which Harrowstorms are a form of hedge magic, it seems, mm -hmm. because, you know, that in and of itself that's uh with the with the reliquary the reliquaries which i actually happen to have one which we can use as a visual prop since we happen to be oh yeah uh yeah so i've got one of these which um for anybody not on the video it is a um it's it's like an urn or a jar which you can do you, like foley effects with it you could probably like like yeah with the top open up when you put it in front of your mic it, it does hold on <laughs> this is great <laughs> See? oh the red magic stuff came out oh there no it is. run IRL. Oh, That's... people are being turned into everybody. zombies and things oh yep. no you got to see the extent of my ability to rp right there yeah. one whooshing sound effect <laughs> <laughs> so like those Things, the dungeons you get to first find out about uh, collecting them. And then as you go into the expansion without, you know, just blatantly spoiling stuff because it's still somewhat relevant, um, the world events or the incursions that you have just popping up are those same reliquaries uh, being controlled by witches, uh, like the Witch's Coven, mm -hmm. and them trying to collect souls for the soul harvest, which is, again, Creep, creepy sounding creepy and stuff. uh yeah so it, it's more of their hedge magic so personally I, I i love those i think they're super fun to play if you haven't actually tried them or played uh the great more expansion of eso yeah yeah uh that's in fact when you held that up it the urn looks really cool I, like there's a little I, bit of like the game player in me that got a little nervous it was like, oh crap, what are those? Ah, so like. so uh, on the flip side too, the actual prop that I have, it weighs a comical amount for being like a resin thing. Like, it looks it looks solid, yeah. It yeah, you, you you could you could probably take out an intruder with uh, uh with that, that prop. <laughs> Someone breaks so. into your house and you like smash it over their head. Reach for the reliquary, you smash it on them, which immediately starts a harrow storm and everything goes downhill from there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, if you guys haven't played this stuff in ESO, I recommend going and checking it out. Um, I love, here's one of the reasons why I love it, Elder Scrolls Online. It, it meets a lot of different needs, but when it comes from a lore perspective, I know there are people out there, and we talked kind of about this a little bit in the last episode, where they're like, oh, it's new stuff, it breaks the lore or whatever. And they're just digging more and more into some of the details that we don't get to see in other games. And I, I love that. I love being able to go, okay, who are these Reachmen? What are they doing? What's their motivation? What were they doing in the second era as opposed to the fourth era? Yeah, what, it, you know, what is this Harrow Storm? How does the magic work? All of those things are very cool. And you dig into that stuff really, really well in the games. Even if you just play through the quest lines, you get so much of that stuff even without reading the books. Um, It's just... 
I don't know. It's just so good just from a lore perspective. Yeah. So, so um, there's just kind of to put this out there before we get deeper into this. There is a ton of stuff about the people in this region, about things that went on during the histories, about the Forsworn and who they evolved from, those kinds of things. And we're going to have to do a second episode in order to do this all justice. If we cram this all into one episode, we're not going to get all the way through it. So to kind of uh, finish up our discussion on this since we're already up 20 something minutes into this um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about their history they um, and I'm just gonna read the uh, the passage here let me pull it up the a uh, little bit about their early society and uh, longhouse emperors and kind of just moving through time a little bit I'll give you kind of a, a, a sense of, of how this went um, following the collapse of the first empire of the Nords, the Western Reach was retaken by the Aldmeri, who slaughtered the majority of the Nord colonists. As a result, this is all the way back in like the first era. Uh, the Nord, as a result, the Nord ancestry of the Reachmen is comparatively weak. Originally, they came from um, the Bretons, if if you remember, and in fact, they actually came from a very specific group, which we'll talk about on the next episode. Um, the proximity of Reachman settlements to Orcish villages meant that the Reachmen frequently traded goods and customs with their mountain neighbors, and it's partly from the Orcs that the Reachmen learned to use hedge magic. This is some of the origin of this for their for their culture. High King Olaf One Eye later reconquered the Reach for Skyrim at some point during his reign between the First Era 420, hey, and 452. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Uh, good old Olaf One Eye also had another nickname. It was Olaf uh, Leaf Eater or something like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> leaf Smoker. Um, <laughs> Uh, things went on. There are some other things to talk about during the first era. There's some information about the legend of Red Eagle. If you remember that in Skyrim, that was a uh, ancient tale from Reach folklore that suggested that sometime during the Alessian Empire, the Reach was ruled by ten kings, and that no men were free. Though, though men were free, the people were scattered and worked, uh, warred amongst themselves. The legend also makes reference to the Reachmen's reverence of the ancient and venerable hag ravens so these cultural bits go all the way back to the first era they're very much ingrained in the people um, by the second era we have uh, the longhouse emperors uh, section of the history during the sixth century of the second era the reachmen seem to have grown particularly powerful eventually leading to the foundation of a reachman dynasty in Cyrodiil known as the longhouse emperors we'll touch on that a little bit more in the next episode and then by the um, events of uh, Elder Scrolls Online, we have certain other events that happen in the games, which we can talk about more later. And um, all of this is to say that they, for the majority of their history, were downplayed. They were um, seen as adversaries with the empires, with the whether it's the uh, Cyrodiilians. <laughs> the Alessians or the Nordic emperors, the Nordic, uh, you know, whether it's Tiber Septum or whoever, they generally were g considered adversaries and people to take their stuff and try to get rid of them because they're a nuisance. And we talked about that very early on in the episode. Um, during the fourth era, we have the Forsworn Uprising, which is what happens during Skyrim. In the Fourth Era, 174, during the Great War, when the Empire did not have the resources available to maintain the Outer Provinces, remember the events of Skyrim, they were dealing with the Thalmor and the, the other things that were going on, the um, conflict in Skyrim between um, the, uh, uh, who were the, uh, what were the guys called? The, um, the guys were, were the blue, um, the Imperials? Stormcloaks? The, the Stormcloaks. The Stormcloaks yeah, were uprising against the Imperials. Which, which, side, yeah, yeah. Say, which side do you need? Yeah, Stormcloaks. Right, right. Yeah, the Stormcloaks yeah. were uprising against the Imperials, so they, they were being pulled in a lot of directions. So it makes sense that they didn't have the forces to kind of hold down the Reachmen anymore. Um, a group of Reachmen led by Ma uh, Madanak, who would become their king, commenced what would later be known as the Forsworn Uprising, gaining control of the Reach and creating an independent kingdom. According to Arian, uh, Arianus? I don't know how to pronounce that one. I'm not sure how you'd pronounce yeah. it. Pronunciation of Arianus. some of these things is not my strong point. I think it's Arianus Arius. 
which is a great name. Um, <laughs> they administered the kingdom uh, relatively peacefully with only a few of the harshest Nord landowners put to death. After two years, their experiment with independence seemed largely largely successful, and the leaders of the Reachmen were beginning to progress, uh, beginning the process of seeking recognition from the Empire. However, in the fourth era, one seventy six, desperate to retake the Reach, and with no Imperial legions available due to the Great War, Hrolfder enlisted the aid of a Nord militia led by none other than Ulfric Stormcloak to retake mm -hmm. the Reach by promising them free worship of Talos. If you've played Skyrim, you know who Ulfric is. He was the one who was trying to be the king who you're in the cart with at the beginning, and he's he's gagged so he can't shout. Yep, that Ulfric. In that year, the Nord militia successfully drove the Reachmen from the city of Markarth, city of Markarth, and reclaimed the Reach. The survivors of the uprising fled into the wilds of the Reach and became known as the Forsworn. So when you are playing Skyrim and, and you're coming up against the Forsworn and they are pissed off at everybody, this is why. Because they had established their own society, they were looking to be recognized by the Empire as a free independent group, a free independent region, and everything fell apart. And they were yep. they were sent out into the wilds, and so like, and that was the thing. When I played through these games, I didn't have a sense of like this is the history under underlying all of this. I was like, who are these crazy people who just live out in the wild? You know, I'm like, oh, okay, maybe they're 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 pissed off at the Nords for some reason, and they're these right. crazy wild people, I guess. Right. I don't but know. There's actually like a lot of background to it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go through this, the next paragraph because this is interesting too. Driven from Markarth, the Forsworn spread across the Reach, fortifying any defensible spot they could find. In the wilds, the Forsworn function as a terrorist organization. That's how we get to know them, right? They are comprised of a series of cells, usually led by Hagraven matrons or undead Briarhearts. With their main tactics being caravan raids and attacking and outlying on outlying settlements. The ongoing dispute between consternation for those Reachmen who were not allied with the Forsworn. Native landowners were frequently under duress by both the Nords and the Forsworn, each party thinking the individual was working for the other. Many Reachmen also lamented that so many of their friends and loved ones were fighting and dying in service of a long lost cause. So that's as far as we get in the history of the Reachmen. And they've managed to survive that whole time. They've managed to be oppressed that whole time and still maintain their cultural identity, which is really, really cool. So did you have something else you wanted to talk about with the Briarhearts? So the Briarhearts <laughs> to me are one of my favorite I don't know, creatures, I guess. They're not even people at this point because they've been like so mutated and stuff. Uh, but one of my one of my favorite little, I don't know, Easter eggs, tricks, whatever you want to call it, is if you are ever playing the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, uh, one really neat thing that the game never really overtly tells you that you can do um, is if you were to sneak up on a Briarheart that is unaware of your uh, you know, existence at the moment, preferably be good at sneaking, which I'm usually not. Um, uh -huh. But you can pickpocket a Briarheart and remove their heart from their inventory. It's a, considered an inventory item because it's also an alchemical ingredient uh, in Skyrim. And if you remove that heart, that's what th that powers the reanimated husk i guess you'd call it of a, of a briar heart and it will immediately kill the enemy regardless of what level it is and it does it completely silently he'll just slump over and <laughs> just, that's it. just, blow, it's just, just yeah they just lump lump over and they're they're all yeah. done it's ragdoll physics galore um oh, which i just thought was so cool because the same way that the Dwemer stuff is always powered by soul gems and things like that. It's kind of neat that these are programmed this, like in a way that it's like, oh, well, if you remove its life source or power source, it basically just powers down because that's how it would work. Since if you actually get a good look at them, they're sort of they're strapped in there with just leather straps and it's like it's still exposed it's pretty nasty looking but Briarhearts are such a creepy and unique enemy as far as i'm concerned uh in the series and kind of 
uh, along the lines of what you said, I, I was trying to browse the exact name of the book that it's in, but I can't find it off the top of my head. One of the overarching themes with um, all Forsworn was during the time of Skyrim, there was a lot of thought that they were just brigands and like thieves and like, oh, you know, they just rob people on the road. But the biggest factor that showed that that was not the case uh, was the fact that often when they would raid many times they would leave the gold or supplies like that clearly wasn't the focus despite the fact that that was trying to be showed it's like no no you shouldn't trust these guys they have no further agenda they're all just you know whack they're crazy jobs. they're crazy yeah yeah where where it seemed like it very quickly if you looked past the surface value of it you would realize they weren't looking out for themselves because many times they would be willing to die rather than be captured, yeah. which is generally not what you're <laughs> going to be doing if all you're looking for is self-gain. And leaving behind the spoils of a raid doesn't really make a lot of sense if that's your end goal as well. So yeah, there yeah. was always hints that there was more to them. It's just you had to kind of look for it, which I thought was an interesting twist uh, since... Not only did the game do that in Skyrim specifically, but that's almost what it was like in game as well as like breaking the fourth wall and playing the game. Yeah. Yeah. It's, they are really cool. Um, and we're going to get a little bit more into this. I, I want to talk at the end of the episode, once we get through the middle, a little bit about Mark Harth. I want to, I want to pick your brain a little bit about some of your memories of, of playing in that region and in the city because I'm excited about that coming to um, Elder Scrolls Online. Um, oh, yeah. But, and then I, I also, also want to uh, reference some of the things people have said in chat, too. So we're going to get into this a little bit more. So stay tuned for that stuff. Let's jump into the middle of the episode so we can get back to seeing things in a little bit. The skies are marked with numberless sparks each a fire, and every one a sign. So, as usual, this show is brought to you by our patrons at patreon.com slash Elder Scrolls Lorecast. And thank you to all of our patrons. We are quickly approaching the end of the month. It, today is the 17th, which means that we have uh, one more episode before we have another patron end of the month call. So if you are interested in joining uh, me and Lotus on the show and being able to chat with us about Elder Scrolls, then check out the Patreon because tier four patrons get to join us for those episodes every month. Um, also, thank you to all of our other patrons for your support of the show as well. You can get ad free episodes and a whole bunch of other things. So go check that out. Also, our shows are brought to you by the sponsors of the shows on the Robots Radio Network. And get this, we have a new sponsor, Lotus. Um, you, you may have heard me talk about uh, Loot Crate and Green Man Gaming mm -hmm. and Gamefly and NordVPN. We've got deals for all of those. Check the links in the show notes. But specifically, we now have audiobooks.com as a sponsor. Oh, there you go. Which I am super excited about because I'm going to pull it up right now. Audiobooks.com. They have tons of books. I have, I've been looking up different books, and every time I look one up on here, they have it. Um, I'm specifically looking up Elder Scrolls. Yep. I was going to say, tell me they have yeah. um, the, Infernal the Infernal City, City Lord of and, Souls, uh, Lord of Souls. One credit each. These are brilliant. I've listened to them. Uh, I've listened. I've, I've actually these versions of the books. I've I've listened to as you know audiobooks uh, while commuting. They're very well done. The voice acting is yep. awesome, and um, you can get these for free. All you have to do is just open up the show notes, click the link, and you will get three books in your first month for free so you get well, you these go. two books and something else and it includes two vip books so even if these are vip books according to their rankings you still get them you can get both of these books and just listen to them like right now so go check that out super cool stuff there's a bunch of other things as well um you can get on here uh one of the other things i would highly recommend is uh the um ice and fire the song of ice and fire series um game of thrones those those things. Oh, nice the books I mean, if you liked the series, uh, not the last two seasons. If you liked, yeah, the, um, the specifically show, the last. Uh, <laughs> if you liked the show and you haven't read the books, the books are are dense, and listening to them as audiobooks is 
an amazing experience. Uh, Roy Del Trees is the guy who does the voice acting for those books, and he's this old, gruff kind of guy, deep mm. voice kind of guy. But he does different voices for the different characters. He is amazing. Like his his voice is like butter in your ears, which sounds disgusting. But just imagine that your ears had taste buds. Nonsense. Oh God, your butter a perfect selling point. <laughs> really is crushed worse it. Worse as I go. Um, <laughs> anyway, go go check out the books. Click the link in the show notes. Go check out the books. Um, I think yep. you guys. Will I've enjoy listened them. to both the. Uh, uh, Lord of Souls and um, Infernal City. Uh, Infernal City, thank you. Yep. On the other books, I originally I am not a huge reader. Like just sit down and I'm going to read a novel or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I got the audio versions of both of those as well, and yeah. they are they're 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 pretty good stories. I especially if you already like this material, it's really good supplementary material i don't think you're gonna draw somebody into the series fresh right like right. don't suggest this to somebody to try to get them into the series but you if you already like the series there's a lot to these books that honestly fits into many many of the games that is overlooked or only nodded to and except for these small portion of us who have actually read or listened to the books you kind of miss it and they're mm -hmm. pretty integral to a lot of things so oh there's there's connection between all sorts of different lore stuff in these oh, books. yeah and uh one of the character one of the main characters is an argonian and there's yep. some really Meg cool, Lim. yeah, um, yeah. His perspective, the way he talks, even the way the voice actor does his voice, but his perspective, his culture, the way he interacts with other people, uh, his connection to um, the trees, the hist, all the of that. Hist, stuff. Yeah, his discussion of him really becoming part of the. This is getting into quite a tangent on this, yeah, but these books cool are great. Stuff. I really enjoyed. It's them. really cool stuff. Um, yeah, it, it's it's very cool to have them try to do the perspective of that uh, as as well. Uh, there's there's some Clavicus violin. There, there's just a lot of a yeah. lot there in those. Daedra, books. Uh, uh, the um, the uh, Daedric Society. There's a lot yep. of insight. living on Umbriel. Yeah, living on like Umbriel so and. Insane. Yeah, yeah. What the Dramora are actually like and how they interact with each other in their own society. Uh -huh. A lot of the stuff that you don't actually get in the games is in the books. So anyway, go check that out. You guys can get some free books. You know where to look. And let's move on to the rest of the show. Yes, yes, you're entirely brilliant. Conquering madness and all that. Blah, 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 blah. So uh, that was a fun little excursion there. Um, let's yeah. <laughs> let's talk about Markarth. I want to uh, actually before we get into Markarth, um, I want to reference a little bit about what some people said in the chat here. Fragile Shark says, and it makes sense that the Th Thalmor Empire would want to keep the Reachmen under control if it can cause Skyrim to expand re expend resources on the problem, which makes Very sense. Much. The enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of concept, like. If yes. we can incite insurrection from underneath the Nords, then that works out for us. That kind of thing. Which, exactly. And, and Thalmor are known for slow playing yes. everyone against each other and <laughs> biding their time. And uh -huh. it's like, as is, they were already kind of nudging. To be fair, I, I mean, depending upon how you want to view the situation, um, nudging Ulfric Stormcloak along because of his kind of bruised ego from his previous failures, which we won't get too into, as like, oh, well, you know, hey, you know, the Skyrim's, you know, you're, you've been shunned in all of this, and it, it, it comes across very straightforward that it's like, well, the Thalmor don't like Talos. Which, okay, that's true, but at the same time, if they can also so equal seeds with okay this needs to be imperial law but then at the same time nudging ulfric forward we're like yeah you're not going to stand for this are you <laughs> right well right. Now, now these two are fighting each other and they don't need to waste resources on the situation no. factor in the elusive wild card that we brought up earlier of the reachmen and the force one it's like okay well now you have three groups i mean they're pretty indifferent it seems like to to um the reachmen themselves they don't necessarily have an agenda overtly against them, but it's like, okay, well, if we push you into the equation, now there are two sides we don't want to deal with. And one side we're indifferent to all fighting amongst themselves while we consolidate our power. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Now that's uh, it's like it's like playing battlegrounds, and you realize that the two other factions <laughs> are duking it off in the middle, and you're like, well, I'm just going to sneak around the edges and take all the stuff that I want while they are busy fighting each other. You know, yep. it, it it just makes sense. It's you know, if you can create a third faction that even if they are ov- obviously underpowered, you know, the Reachmen were never going to take down the the nords you know they they just weren't they they didn't no. have the strength to do it but they could be a really good distraction yep. and and a problem and create fear among the nords in that area to to be worrying about this while they're not paying attention to the other things that are going on so it makes a lot of sense. Um, mm-hmm. If you have any other questions while we while we were finishing up this episode, feel free to put them in chat. I would love to see your questions or just some of your comments, some of your thoughts on some of this stuff. Um, now, to wrap this episode up, this region is specifically known for Markarth. That's basically the capital city of the region. And there's a lot going on in Markarth. Uh, as a reminder, Markarth was the city that was built on top of the Dwemer ruins. Um, directly there in the city like the city itself is Dwemer ruins with Nordic buildings just kind of built into it yes it's It's, really cool looking it's a very vertical city as well Mm -hmm. kind of built around like like you said it's the Nordic ruins built into the Dwemer ruins and the walls but the way that the whole city is constructed around the waterfalls makes it really unique too yeah yeah. So, do you have any like specific memories of dealing with Reachmen other than the Briarheart stuff? Or being yeah, the Briarheart stuff I love. Um, so, Markarth is. To be fair, that's probably my absolute favorite of the cities. Wow. I, I yeah, yeah. I, I like I like a lot of them. Uh, they're all kind of memorable in their own way, but Markarth is just very very unique in its in its construction and it's i don't know it it's oddly creepy because of just some of the stuff you deal with in skyrim as well Mm -hmm. the giant crypts where you get uh you can get yourself involved with the namira's uh quest line and i mean i guess it's not a huge deal if we it spoils spoils some stuff from a game from 2011 and 2020 (laughs) Uh, right (laughs) nine-year-old game (laughs) Yeah, I was gonna say. I feel like you, ha- if you haven't played this quest line yet, the, you really kind of out of the realm of safety. Um, what um, what is there though is uh, you you get this whole cannibal cult thing involved with the New Year thing, and uh, one of, one of the quotes that I just always find very funny is the meat vendor out front who is part of this conspiracy uh-huh. is. Uh, <laughs> I just love that he's always saying the bloodiest cuts of meat in the reach. And I'm just like, oh, that is not a selling point, dude. Like, what are you doing? (laughs) And yes, the Mace of Molag ball quest is also in Markarth. That is correct. Fragile Shark. I couldn't, I couldn't recall. I I saw the comment. I was like, where, where was that? Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, is it, isn't the, um, the haunted building in Markarth? That is that is the that's that is part the beginning of the, of the maze. Yes, yes, that okay. is the yes. Yeah, yeah. Yep, that's the place. Yes. Oh man, that was great. I remember coming across that the first time and being like, "Wait a minute, this something's something's wrong here." <laughs> Just like there's yep. something going on. Yeah, that's where you have to bring in the. Uh, you have to find yourself a priest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, man, Skyrim's such a good game. So. Here's my other question to kind of follow up on this stuff because we all have such uh, memories of this of this area What do you think it's going to be like two eras earlier? What things are going to be the same? What do you think is going to be different? And do you think we're going to actually get to explore some of the the same parts bits and pieces of the city even like under underneath the city? You know like the the dungeony parts of it. I I would hope that the um that the city itself and some of the surrounding wildlands will will be there. The biggest question I have, because it's it's a decent sized region and this is a zone DLC. It's not a chapter expansion, so it doesn't need to be nearly as immense as right. uh, the full chapter. It's an addition. Um, so you'll get the overland, you'll get the city itself. Um, with how big they've made it apparent that Blackreach is, I'm very curious if it will have any more of Blackreach underneath. Yes. Because 
Yes. The Dwemer ruins where uh, Kelselmo has his uh, excavation, I guess you'd call it, mm-hmm. going on during the time of Skyrim. That is more Dwemer ruins, which coincide with Blackreach. So you, you might end up finding another entrance down to Blackreach with some type of something involved with that since it's such an integral part of the story. Do you think that's going to be the main uh, Markarth itself and the uh, the Dwemer ruins and then maybe Blackreach? Do you think that's going to be the main, I don't know, dungeon of the map? Do <sighs> you think that's where we're going to descend into in order to continue the storyline? I'm curious if um, sometimes we get an arena is what it's called, which is like a challenge section mm-hmm. with the um, uh, I can't think of the word that I literally just said. The zone DLC. Yeah, zone DLC. Um, yeah. So uh, it seems like there's potential that if they did want to do an arena, they could do something like that below the city. But I'm curious how far out into the surrounding wildlands we're going to get as well. Is it just Markarth or how much or is it going to go throughout the reach is is my real question. I'll be very curious to see in, I believe it's two days from today. I believe it's the 19th. So... Yeah, by the time yeah, this is up for everybody, um, this will yeah, be out so there you uh, go. tomorrow for patrons, and then the day after that. Um, so tomorrow being Friday, the day after being Saturday, uh, for yes. everyone else. <laughs> um, yeah, cool. Um, also, if you guys want to check out the, um, the actual video version of this, when I've been trying to incorporate more pictures, like the map behind me, and answer some of the questions in the feed and those kinds of things. If you want to check out the video version of this, it will be up on YouTube. Um, at the Robots Radio YouTube channel, which is in the, the links underneath the show notes. So, cool. Any other last thoughts, uh, Lotus, before we move on? No, I think that pretty pretty much uh, a, a solid foundation and overview of, of the Reach and its mm-hmm. inhabitants, so to speak. Yeah, next next time, on the next episode, we're actually getting, going to get into uh, some of the, the Reachman clans. Um, their connection to Dami House, the Minotaur, who shows up in Elder Scrolls Online, and yep. uh, the Keptu, which may be a word or a name of a group of people that you are not familiar with. This is actually um, some of the older parts of the connection of the Reachmen to their history. So uh, we kind of covered an overview and then also a lot of the stuff that happened that we know about in the fourth era. But we're going to go all the way back to the beginning again and dig a little bit deeper. So I'm excited for that uh thank you for joining me again lotus this has been super fun of course do you guys have any you have anything uh, cool cool going on you have any uh streams happening lately where you're raising more money for charity or anything um so we will have an exact schedule but it's looking like uh in the uh, the situation for my extra life marathon that i'm involved with i believe our tentative date will be october 17th i'll have an official announcement definitely by next show we're just kind of ironing out the details as to how long uh we're going to be able to marathon this year last year we did 38 hours i believe it was between me and arc um yeah i remember this yes i jumped in (laughs) wait 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 no i jumped in when you were you were forced to play uh first person of you oh dear lord yes, yes. i that's had when first I, person yes. imperial city oh and then God. when i when i went in the other room uh to, to grab a drink or something like that uh <laughs> yes. my wonderful friends decided to take off my real gear and attach uh <laughs> white gear that was worth more money and gave me no bonus stats <laughs> and then i had to fight the uh simulacrum in the imperial city sewers oh my which God. i was I thought I was just very bad from being so sleep deprived <laughs> until afterwards I realized I was like, where is all my gear? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, I remember this. And you were like, you had to play first person perspective. Wow. And you yes, were like, oh my God, making... this is making me sick. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yes. I, I, I like to quest in first person, but man, when everything CC throwing you around, it is, it is rough on the equilibrium. Oh yeah, Totally. Totally. Oh, man. Yep. Yeah. Is Tales doing anything cool? Um, if you guys listen to this show and you don't know about Tales of Tamriel, I don't know what to tell you. They've been around a lot longer than this show. <laughs> Go check them out. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. What's, um, what's but no, I was going to say we've been doing our normal thing. And like I said, we'll have uh, fine details uh, by next show on the exacts of what we'll be doing for the charity event, which uh, all goes to for anybody that doesn't know what Extra Life is. It helps uh, support families in need and children who cannot afford to get the medical medical care that they require so it covers the costs of that to make sure that they 
are provided the care they need and no one ends up, ugh, ends up getting turned away, which is a very, very awesome cause that I've been proud to be part of helping for the past eight years at this point. So that's awesome. That's awesome. That's, that's really, really cool. Um, Ishi streams notes here. There's a cool thing happening tomorrow with the other two tales hosts. Um, yes. Also, that's a very good point. Uh, so our, uh, Patreons over at Tails um, for the champion tier get to make requests. And uh -huh. uh, tomorrow, one of the requests is Arkaneer, one of the other hosts, will be tanking on North America. He is from Turkey. So that is um, not great <laughs> not, for his connection. Right. Yes. And uh, the request is Kinara, uh, the Patreon in question, is subjecting them to veteran Moon Hunter Keep, uh, I believe hard mode on the North American server, which is going to be quite an experience in the struggle bus realm. Uh -huh. so. Is uh, Hyper Pixie playing too? Or the, the two of them? Yes, she is. I, I yeah. assume she'll be healing would be, yeah. since that's her main role. Right. Uh, yeah, it, it, it should be interesting to be sure. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'll, yeah, tune in for that too if you guys uh, are listening to this before that happens. Um, cool. Awesome, man. Uh, let's see. Do I have anything else going on? I've still been streaming at twitch.tv slash robots radio. Uh, I've been playing more Fallout <laughs> than I have Elder Scrolls Online, but I definitely need to jump back in the Elder, Elder Scrolls Online. There still are some um, quests that I haven't finished in the Greymore expansion, some of the side quests. Um, I <laughs> I was putting out gameplay episodes where you guys could follow through my role-playing adventures. I'm sure some of you guys have been listening to them. In fact, I have the data in order to see that you've been listening to them. Um, I, I know a lot of you guys enjoy them. In fact, some people have written me saying, like, where are they? Where are the new ones? I ran out of content, and I just ran out of quests, and I need to go just do more. I need to make more. <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, other things have come up, and playing through the quest lines hasn't been the main priority. Um, but I hope to do that again soon. Um, I might just have to stock a bunch of those. I do have kind of this internal want to go through all of the quests and document all of them through role playing as Sir Robots uh, throughout the entire game. But of course, that would take a very long time. So, and there's lots of other games coming out and things. So, my attention keeps getting thrown from one place to another. But hopefully, I can get back into that. And if you, if you are interested and in that content and it isn't being put out in audio version yet I'd love for you to just come hang out in the in the stream because you might catch me doing some of it before it turns into audio content later um, So you're welcome to do that as well uh, And just like Lotus all of the all of my stream support is going to charity right now up until the election Everything that I raise on twitch is going to support represent dot us which fights corruption in the government which benefits Everybody except for the people being corrupt, but screw those guys. Nobody cares. Yeah, nobody cares about them. <laughs> yeah, no th th Those yeah. people can go, you know, I don't know. Yeah, if you're already corrupt, nobody cares like, yeah, If you, if you don't are count. corrupt in our government, then just get the f freaking get out of the government yeah. like we want our government back So, um, yeah, anyway, that's what's going on. Uh, thank you for tuning in as usual everybody It's good to see you guys here in chat and thank you for listening and until next time I don't know don't don't cut your chest open and put a alternate heart in there because somebody might pickpocket it and then you'll just slump over and die. That's my advice to you. All right, everybody. Talk to you guys later. Have a good one. Mm -hmm. See Bye. you. <laughs>